So hello, good morning or good afternoon. So my name is Eric Pirat, I'm a professor here at the University of Liège in Belgium, and by background I'm a geological engineer. So maybe first I would like to give you some historical explanation about this degree in uh, engineer geologist, we say it in, in Liège. I think it's quite interesting for you guys who are mostly mining engineers from what I understood. Uh, here in Liège, we have a long tradition of mining, essentially coal mining. It stopped a few decades ago, but it had been lasting for several centuries. And um, we've always graduated mining engineers and geologists. But in 1900, so already more than 100 years ago, they realized that the dialogue between the geologist and a mining engineer was quite difficult. So they decided to create this new degree, which is, uh, let's say, it's not an engineer, it's not a geologist, it's a kind of hybrid education where hopefully you know enough about the complexity of natural resources, but you also understand the technology. And this is a bit the topic of my course today. As you see from the title, we'll speak about mineral mapping techniques to optimize downstream processing rules. So it will not be exactly about mining, because as you can understand, I will address things that are both upstream, in terms of characterization of the resource, and I will link it to the downstream processing, which is often called mineral processing. To introduce the subject, I love starting with chemistry. Now, this is not an error, it's intentionally that I indicated K, mystery, because essentially when we look at a chemical analysis, we can hardly guess what it is. So if I look at this chemical analysis, I don't know if you have any idea what this can represent. Just try to guess. Of course, I can't hear you, so I hope you are throwing some ideas in the classroom. You see that essentially we have oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, so not a lot of metals. There are metals, but probably in the range of tens of a percent and maybe most often PPMs. We have phosphorus, though, that can maybe lead you to the right answer. Okay, let me give you the answer. The answer is our body. Yes, this is the average composition of a human body. So from that perspective, just looking at the chemical analysis, we're all the same. Roughly, I probably represent this amount of material and you individually more or less represent the same amount of material. So that makes doesn't make any difference between us. So this is essentially to tell you that the mystery of the human body is certainly not told by the chemical analysis. As you all know, these elements are bound together into basic molecules that we call nucleotides. So you see these four nucleotides, adenine, timine, cytosine, guanine, are the four basic molecules that form our DNA. And as you know, this DNA sequence is a unique signature of individuals. So, since about 2000, we are now able to completely unravel the secrets, the mystery of a DNA sequence. And this is absolutely fascinating to me. Of course, it has nothing to do with geology, it has nothing to do with mining. But I want to take that example just to show you that we have incredible technologies. And when we want these technologies to be efficient, we are absolutely incredible. Look at this. This is the coast of the first human genome decoding. It costed roughly a hundred million dollars effort to decode the first human genome. Today, you can ask for analysis of your personal genome and it will barely cost you a thousand euros. How is it even possible? I'm totally amazed by these kind of results. And we're so far away from having the same results in geology that really strikes me. Because if I could, I would love to have the same kind of analysis for the ore bodies, not our body, but ore bodies. We know the complexity of ore bodies. They are a mix of different kinds of minerals, and we would like to know which minerals they are and how they are arranged. So basically we have the same kind of request, and this is where we need to develop more technologies to characterize the complexity of our natural ore bodies, the deposits. We also need to be able to build more and more digital twins of the old bodies so that we can simulate a lot of processes from mining to mineral processing. One thing I would like to stress, like I did it with this degree, engineer Geolog, is the fact that we are not all looking in the same way at all bodies. If I take the George's perspective, as I 
already told you more or less, that John Gissi is very much interested by the history of these deposits, what we call metallogeny. How come that metals, minerals concentrate in this place up to giving economic concentrations? So a geologist, I would say, is essentially exploring the past. He tries to understand the geology, the tectonics, he tries to understand where the fluids were involved, the pressure, temperature, all things that do not really interest engineers. Often I say that when a geologist finds a rock, he tries to find where it comes from, so he's looking backwards. As engineers, we look at the same rock and we say, hey, what could we do with it? We're looking in the opposite direction, we're looking downstream. How will this particular piece of rock or ore, how will it behave downstream? So we start from the same object, but we look in two opposite directions. Okay, as mining engineers, you're probably privileged in economic vision. You want to know the grade, you want to know the tonnages, you want to know how much of these great tonnage blocks are economically mineable, you want to know, if, to know if you will make some benefit. This is all the question of estimating reserves, proven or probable reserves, etc. And if you have a nice modeling of your deposit, then eventually you will go to mine planning, you will do pit optimization, all these things that you probably know, which are your personal responsibility, take the same information about rates and tonnages, etc. all the information you have from the deposit, but look at it from an economic perspective. A third perspective is the one of the metallurgists. This is exactly, again, looking at the same material, but trying not to, to anticipate what will happen in the mineral processing. Usually this step, I would say it's often one step too far, so usually mineral processing engineers are not so much involved in the feasibility stage of a mining project. Well, there are, there are some tests which are being made, but quite limited because the amount of material available for testing is also limited. I realized through my professional experience that we should really build the bridge between geology and mineral processing because a lot of problems happen during the lifetime of a mine and it's often too late. They should have been anticipated by geologists. We will discuss all this, but I just remember this example where I was invited to work on a quarry. It's a dolomite quarry here in Belgium. They had been mining for decades and they never saw that there was any difference in their deposits until regular complaints by clients really rose the problem of eventually the existence of different qualities. We looked at chemistry, we couldn't find anything, and finally it's the microscopy which revealed differences between different strata of this dolomite. And the differences were essentially in terms of porosity, in terms of crystal size, in terms of presence of some uh, contaminating minerals, whatever, all things that could not be anticipated from fieldwork and from chemistry. So here again, the question is, how can we characterize an ore and a full ore body trying to anticipate the future, trying to anticipate specifically the processing? So it's a question, as I said, of bridging the divide between different disciplines. Of course, it's very good to have a training which is balanced between geology and engineering, as I already said, but it's also true that in a real project, it's about bringing people together. So all the engineers, the geologists, all the people who are involved in a mining project should be around the table to try to find the best possible solution. So it's all about dialogue, but the dialogue is only possible if we speak the same language. And to speak the same language, we need to develop that language, we need to develop the technologies which will be efficient for establishing this dialogue. This vocabulary is the one of geometallurgy. This is how we kill today this discipline trying to link geology with metallurgy. So basically the idea is a bit similar to the one we just saw in biology. The biologist went from functional biology to molecular biology. Well, we have to go to molecular geology. In fact, molecular geology is known since centuries. It's simply mineralogy. But what we still miss, as I've said already, is that we missed fast and accurate mineral identification. So we need to compete to have very powerful techniques to quickly identify our, the equivalent of our nucleotides, the molecules which are the building blocks of our ore. Then we do need to do the equivalent of the sequencing. We need to characterize how the minerals are being intertwined, how they are uh, mixed in this 
or body, how coarse the crystals can be, their porosities, fractures, whatever, describe the spatial arrangement of our minerals has to be quantified. And finally, if we are really good, from all that information, we would be able to predict functionality, which is a bit what people are trying to do also in biology. So this is my dream. I will not achieve the dream at the end of this course. I'm just introducing the subject, but hopefully raising some interest from your side. So let's see what we have as techniques and let's again stress the need for mapping minerals. So again, I start with a simple case. I ask you basically, do you see any difference between these two objects? This is a piece of laterite, average laterite from, from Australia, for example, and this is a smartphone. So, I mean, the, the, the difference is so striking to you, you probably wonder why I'm asking is there a difference? Well, again, because there is no difference in terms of chemistry. At least if you analyze these elements, there is no major difference between the smartphone and the laterite. Okay, I agree, if you go for copper, we'll find more copper in this one than in this one. It will be 100 times more copper. You'll probably also find a bit more silver, a bit more gold, and a bit of cobalt. But for the rest, most of the other elements, they will be essentially the same. So there is no major difference. So the difference between Letterite and smartphone has to do with the way these elements are arranged. Of course, here we have a lot of hydroxides, here we have metallic forms, etc. But it does mean that in terms of processing, no one would ever think about using the same process to try to extract iron, aluminium, whatever from this rock, and to try to do the same from this kind of material. Definitely, we know that the speciation, the mineral species, are essential. Okay, this seems obvious, but I can tell you many stories where people completely overlook this reality. Let me take this example. So several years ago, I was invited in Turkey because there is this heap, 2.5 million tons of slags from the 19th century. And uh, the analysis of a series of samples gave some interesting results typically showing that potentially we have here material that can be remined, reprocessed to collect copper, 0.76%, that's quite high, and certainly copper, 0.38%. They had already done some tests, they were not successful, and they had a good idea to call me to have a closer look at that material, because at least in the understanding that I just tried to stress, we consider it's important to characterize before even starting to do some processing. So in those good old times, it's 1990, we took some pictures in optical microscopy, we were able to identify some major minerals in that slag. No real surprise, you have a lot of uh, firelight, which is the iron silicate, you have some sulfides remaining, and you have essentially some spinners and iron oxides. Already in those times, the Identification of minerals by image analysis was possible, so we were quite lucky to have good contrast between the minerals. We managed to do a mineral map, and we managed to quantify the fractions of the different minerals. So we managed to have this result here in terms of weight percent, saying, okay, in this material, we typically have 65% of finite, we have about 6% of FeO, rustite, etc., and we have only a few percent roughly 4% of pyrotite and 1.2% of copper sulfides. We could not find any obvious copper bearing mineral. So we went to the microprobe and we tried to analyze the different major minerals for their global content. And we came up with the second column telling us that on average you have 0.5% cobalt in firelight and you have only obviously 0.15% of cobalt in rustite, etc. So from those techniques, which are were already around uh, the corner in uh, 1990, they were quite common techniques, we could come up with a cobalt deportment or a cobalt distribution in the slack, which showed that 81% of the cobalt is trapped into the network of fire, which is this iron silicate. So from this, you know, obviously, that it is not even worth trying to do comminution to liberate sulfides and then eventually try to do flotation because you will not recover any cobalt. The sulfide fraction does not contain a lot of cobalt. 
Uh, we published this in 1991, and years later, typically 15 years later, I still see studies which are reporting about different tests and trials they made and complaining that they could not recover COVID. So that's another issue where it's good to do the work, but it's another question to communicate it properly and make sure that people do not uh, repeat the same errors. As you can see from this study, they claim that they could not recover the cobalt. It was still in the tailings after flotation, but they, they managed to recover cobalt after roasting at 500 degree plus uh, dissolution and leaching. So probably totally uneconomic. I hope I convinced you that this step of characterization is absolutely fundamental. It is not just about looking at microscopic details. Ideally, we should bring it back into the deposit. So the full philosophy of geometology is to reach a ge geometrical modeling to be able to build a twin, a digital twin of our deposit, taking pictures at the scale of the microscope, also taking pictures at the scale of course, so we have different scale issues, and bringing that information back into models and developing other geostatistical tools. We cannot use the classical geostatistics on the kind of thing that we measure in microscopy and in core scanning. So there's still a long way to go. This is not yet mature, but we hope in the future to be able to produce models of deposits which do not only represent grades, like copper grades, but which will tell us which minerals can be found, what is typically the crystal size, what is the porosity, what is the amount of fractures, all these things which are so essential to anticipate future problems in terms of comminution, in terms of flotation, in terms of hydrometallurgy, etc. So, having convinced you that we need those techniques, let's have a quick look at what kind of techniques are available today. Essentially, all these techniques for mapping minerals, for taking images of minerals, are based on the same principle. We have a source, we have a sample, and we have a sensor. The source is typically electromagnetic radiation that will shine onto the sample. Our sample is this sample of ore, this sample of minerals that we try to better understand. There is an interaction between the electromagnetic radiation and our sample, and we measure that interaction using a sensor. When I say interaction, it can be typically specular reflectance, it can be diffuse reflectance, it can be fluorescence, it can be absorption, a lot of different processes ongoing when you have interaction between electromagnetic waves and crystalline materials. I cannot review all the techniques, so obviously I'll take some of the most evident ones, and the first one I would like to mention is obviously the scanning electron microscope. I start with this one because it's using a scanning principle. In other words, we have a beam, in this case an electron beam, which is sent to the surface of my sample. We have typically a spot size of roughly, let's say, two or three microns. And in order to build an image, we need, of course, to sweep this beam all across the sample. This is possible with electron beams because we have deflectors and we can easily bring this beam from left to right and top to bottom and cover a certain surface at a certain speed. By the way, you understand here that if I want to cover a certain surface in a certain delay, a certain amount of time, I will have an image with variable resolution depending on the time I spent on each and every pixel. So if I want to have a very high spatial resolution, if I want to have a lot of pixels for one line, I obviously will need to go faster to cover the whole surface in a given time. If I accept a lower resolution, so less pixels, then I can stay longer at each and every point. I can wait longer to properly measure the interaction between the beam and the sensor. So the main message here is that there is always a trade-off between spectral resolution, the quality of the signal, and spatial resolution, the number of pixels. This is important to keep in mind because 
as you will see in electron microscopy, you will probably be disappointed to see that sometimes we need like half an hour or one hour to map still a very small surface and having only a few thousand or millions of pixels takes really a lot of time. The good thing with the electron microscope is that based on electron, an electron beam, given this electron beam has sufficient intensity, sufficient acceleration, you can generate a series of responses, you have secondary electrons, you can have cathodoluminescence, most importantly for us we have backscattered electrons and we have x-rays. The backscattered electrons give us pictures such as this one where you have different ray levels. To keep it simple, the black regions are regions of low average atomic number, the brightest regions are regions with high average atomic number. So this is already interesting, but doesn't tell us about the exact chemistry. Where it becomes interesting in the electron microscope is when we look at the X-rays which are being emitted after being hit with, these, with this electron beam. So the so-called EDX or energy dispersive X-ray imaging allows us to build maps of the different elements we're interested in. So we can use the detector to focus on a certain X-ray intensity characteristic of aluminium, iron and silicon and for example with these maps, semi-quantitative to quantitative maps of elemental presence. If our dwell time, if the integration time, if the time we spend on each and every pixel is long enough, then we start having a good quantification of the elemental composition and we could, like in this seismologic system that we have here in the edge, we can go from the EDX spectrum to a chemical composition and we can use stoichiometry, a composition of minerals, to identify these minerals and end up having a mineral map. But this is typically what takes half an hour to one hour to be achieved before we were able to move to the next scene. So typically a scene here, if you have a resolution of, let's keep it simple, two microns, if you measure a region of only a few uh, hundreds of microns in size, you still spend half an hour to do a biological mapping. So it's quite time consuming if you want to cover a representative sample of your surface. But it's extremely accurate in terms of information it gives. Now, let's leave the electron microscope aside and let's move to uh, another imaging mode, which is the landscape mode. So here we have cameras which are capable of looking at the line, not just at the pixel, we look at the line. So we have an illumination system and our camera is typically taking the picture of one line. If I want to have a full image, I need to move either the camera or the sample. So in this simple example here, I'll move my sample, for example, a sample on a conveyor belt or a sample on a push by linear motor will give me a two-dimensional image by just being moved in the opposite direction to the line of the sensor. So we have an optical resolution in the x direction, we will have a mechanical resolution for the y direction, which is something we need to handle properly, but it's possible. So this kind of principle we use a lot in uh, core scanning typically. We bring the core trays, we place them on the kind of conveyor belt, and the core tray will be moved linearly. And while the core tray is passing under the camera, we take pictures of lines. So in this scheme here of a prototype that we're developing together with DMT in Germany, within the EIT Romantis project Ancolog, in this scheme you see that we have two cameras, one which is targeting the visible and the near infrared, another one targeting the short wave infrared, so we cover from, let's say, 400 nanometers to uh, 2,500 nanometers here with two cameras. These two cameras are looking through mirrors, are looking exactly at the same line and you see here the elliptical uh, collectors, reflectors, which are shining lines on this particular region. So at each moment in time, we take a picture of a line. For every pixel of this line, we have a full spectrum, a full spectrum from 400 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. This data, which we call hyperspectral imaging, this data needs to be processed, we need to classify, the different signals that we find, we do it typically with machine learning, so there's a long phase of training the system. And thanks to machine learning, we manage to do what I call computer-assisted 
logging. So we managed to automatically recognize the main mythologies which are of importance to the geologist. So if we do it properly, we get a classification. It's not exactly a mineral map in this case. It's a lithological map. Because the resolution is such, we're typically looking, you see, at pixels of 100 to 300 microns, and there are few pixels which are pure minerals. So often we have a mix of minerals, we have mixels as we call them, so it's better to speak about mythology because one given pixel corresponds to a given type of rock, and not frequently, at least not frequently, to a single mineral. Last example. Uh, I would like to take is an example of area scan where we have sensors that are capable of taking a two-dimensional picture at once. You know them very well. These are similar to the ones you use to take pictures of your family, similar to the sensors you have in your smartphone, either CMOS or CCD. The difference here is that we use scientific cameras which have higher sensitivity, often higher resolution, etc. But fundamentally it's the same technology. The good thing here is that we are capable of taking millions of pixels in only one shot. So there is no movement of the sample. We have an optical resolution in both X and Y, which is fixed by the specification of the sensor. So this is typically what we will use in optical microscopy, replacing the human eye with a camera. And we can even go further than the human eye. So instead of just using red, green and blue, which is the human vision, we will, for example, use a palette of different filters and we'll take pictures in optical microscopy at different wavelengths. With this, we're more powerful than human eyes. We managed to do kind of color imaging. In fact, I should say multispectral imaging. And again, with machine learning, we can identify different groups, different clusters, different minerals that we can map. The big difference with electron microscopy here is that this is much faster than electron microscopy. It's a question of seconds, but we don't know the chemistry of these phases. Eventually, we know which mineral it is, and from the formula, we can have an estimate of the chemistry, but of course, we're not exactly sensing the chemistry of our minerals. So at this point, I have mineral maps. I have Nice pictures where every pixel belongs to a mineral or belongs to a rock. But now the next step is, of course, to see how we can quantify that information to eventually feed the geometrical modeling that we would like to achieve. So this we will see in the next sequence. Okay. So at this stage, we have pictures of minerals, we have mineral maps, we have Millions of pixels, which all correspond to one given mineral species or eventually one lithology, one rock species. So the information is there, but we still need to formalize it. We need to quantify that information to make sure that we can feed our geometrical models. I would also like to stress the fact that for the moment we have two dimensional information. The techniques that I just show you were typically two dimensional. They're looking at slabs. They could be rough surfaces, they could be cut surfaces, but they were never three-dimensional. So of course we know we have three-dimensional techniques, we now have microtomography and similar technologies, but they are still very slow and also they will not give you the compositional information that you're looking for. If you have a synchrotron, you can expect some micro XRF and you could hope to have some three-dimensional mineralogy, but with microtomography this is a bit uh, over-optimistic, not really realistic today. But despite that, of course, there is interest also for using 3D imaging techniques. I don't forget them. But I was more stressing the importance of two-dimensional techniques, and I'm also very much looking at techniques which are fast and accurate, as I said initially. So let's move to the next step, where now we are trying to go for process-oriented characterization. So here again, we can compute a lot of numbers, but the intention is to really have values which are linked to the process we're looking for. So the way we will quantify the information is quite important here. So the very first measure that we all have in mind is what we call model analysis. In other words, if you have a section, here it's a section with different particles, and these particles have been classified into a blue, a yellow, a green, an orange, and even a pink mineral, and some gray minerals. Okay, this is my mineral map, whatever these minerals are. 
And the first question I have is, for example, well, how much is there of the yellow mineral, how much is there of the blue mineral, etc. The good news is that we know since 1850 that we can just count the number of pixels, make the ratio of the blue pixels versus the total number of pixels, and we'll get an idea about the volumic ratio. This is known as the first principle of stereology. Basically, it tells you that the proportion of points PP is equal to the proportion in area AA is even equal to the proportion of volume VV. There is, of course, a trick. Well, first, in this picture here, where I have particles, of course, I have to take away the dark gray part, which is the resin, but that's not too difficult. I just discount these pixels. But in a more general case, you certainly understand that this relationship, this first principle of stereology, is only possible if we have random sections. To give you an example, imaging you have a cake, which is vanilla and chocolate. You have one layer of vanilla, one layer of chocolate, one layer of vanilla, one layer of chocolate. If you want to know the amount of chocolate and vanilla, you will not just do a horizontal cut, because you might fall 100% into chocolate and have a wrong perception. So you understand that you need to slice your cake in a series of random orientations. And obviously it's the same with our rocks and our orcs. We need to have random sections. Well, here we have a particle system. So we have particles that have been properly randomized into the resin before being cut and polished. This is a very important know-how uh, because it's the key to the accuracy of our evaluation here. So I can tell you it has been done properly, and so we can consider that all these sections and particles are random. Based on the fact that we have random section, we can just count the number of pixels and have an estimate. Of course, the more particles we look at, the better our results. And here comes the second problem we have. We have the so-called nugget effect. Let's look at this pink mineral here. I hope you see it. There are a few pixels which are of this mauve pink color. Uh, integral with the orange phase. So let's say there is only less than 1% of this phase in this scene. But who knows, maybe in the next image, if we move away a few millimeters, maybe we'll find a particle which is absolutely 100% of this uh, pink mauve color. So you see that the problem we have is how many particles should we look at before having a good estimate? And there's no easy answer to the question of the number of particles you should look at. There is an answer which is based on Gilles theory, for those who are familiar with sampling theory. This answer basically tells you that the number of particles you will have to look at is proportional to the square of the largest diameter of the face you're trying to measure. So if I have a face which is forming big nuggets, think about gold, so imagine you have no gold in this scene, but in other scenes you might certainly have a big nugget of gold, there you understand that if there is a very limited amount of gold, but in the form of a few exceptional big nuggets, we'll run into troubles. We'll have to measure a very large surface, a very huge amount of particles. Whereas if we have a mineral with an average abundance and also reasonably uh, well disseminated grains, then we have a more homogeneous idea of the distribution of this mineral, and we can certainly look at much less particles. So this we formalized, and there are not many people who did it, we formalized it into a stopping criteria for model analysis, saying that basically we have a formula, and based on some a prior knowledge about grade, about uh, grain size, etc., we have a formula to stop our analysis. We apply it here to a mix of different sulfides and quartz. We measure the amount of pyrite, the amount of pyrite in a series of images gives a distribution, like you see here. So very often we have images with very low pyrite amounts. Sometimes we have images that contain up to 16%. So this is the distribution. You see it's skewed. Although pyrite is not exactly forming nuggets, we have a skewed distribution of pyrite throughout our images, which is not easy to deal with. We try to estimate the amount of pyrite with our formula. And we see that with the number of images increasing, our estimate is coming closer to the reality, to the exact value. The exact value, we know it in this case by chemistry, 
and because we made the mix of minerals ourselves, this exact value is this red line here, nine point something. You see that our average after one, two, hundred, 150, 250 images is unbiased. It's coming close to the red line. But what is more important is that we can also give an idea of the confidence interval. So after 200 or 150 images, the confidence interval is still very large. It will take a lot more images to really bring this confidence interval to minimum levels. So this is bad news, especially if you have a slow system, but this has been done with optics and as I said, it can be quite fast. So reasonably, we have some criteria. With electron microscope, people usually stop because they are too lazy, because it takes too much time, or because they just have one sample. So I take here examples that we have from a recent study. We received data from a partner. We have the ICP analysis, so that is the chemical analysis on the concentrate, the coarse fraction of the concentrate, the finer fraction, the coarse fraction of the tailing, the fine fraction of the tailing. The chemistry gives us iron and copper. From the automated mineralogy, from the electron microscope, we know how many particles were analyzed, and based on the mineralogy, the iron content was recomputed and the copper content was recomputed. As you can see for the concentrate, where we have like 30% and 26% of iron and copper, you see that the result with image analysis are really good after roughly, in this case, the partner analyzed 600 and 2,600 particles, the error is not too big. But in the case of the tailings, where you have this nugget effect, you have only a few particles containing pyrite or calcopyrite, you see that the rates are much lower, and you can imagine that you have a strong nugget effect. They stop much too early, so they have a horrible, a horrible error in terms of estimate. We try to do a bit better, but we just spent, instead of one or two hours of analysis in a short dwell time, we went for five, six hours in a double dwell time. Uh, we're not using our criterion of stopping here, we, we just use this uh, duration. And you see that even though we improve a bit because we're now looking at 2,500 particles everywhere, not just in the concentrate, but also in the tailings, you see that we are still far away from the reality. So we still have a 50% error. We are still estimating 3.7% iron instead of 2.5. So if you have a low grade with coarse particles, you should be warned that you will need to spend hours and hours and hours in electron microscopy, if not days, to get a good result. So this is bad news. It means that we still need to work to improve our technologies. Now, the good news is that you should always, always use different techniques and make sure that you cross-validate. Often, if you do microscopy, you will have done ICP or chemical analysis, ICP, atomic absorption, whatever, before that. You might also have XRD, X-ray diffraction. So when you have the three of them, automated mineralogy using microscopy, X-ray diffraction, and essentially chemistry, you can consider that your chemistry is maybe the reference because you're typically dissolving much more material. So you're looking at a bigger amount of material. If you take your chemistry as a reference, and if you have your mineralogy, you can recompute things. You can do element to mineral conversion as much as possible. And you can adjust your model analysis in microscopy to a certain extent to make sure that both fit. So here, the dotted red line is our mineral comes from the recomputation of our mineralogy to fit the chemistry given by RCP, which is the green line. This is something we should do, but of course, we also have to be careful and critical. Chemistry is not always correct, but it is a way when we don't have enough time to analyze enough particles, it's at least a way to make sure that we're not too far away from reality. So the main message is always cross-validate. Now let's come to other measures that we absolutely need for mineral processing, and it has to do with particle size. So in this case, again, we're looking at loose particles that have been embedded in resin, but this could be also a massive piece of ore where I, where I want to look at the crystal size. So in both cases, I want to measure the size of the particle. The size of a particle is typically a three-dimensional problem, so it, it's hard to guess from a section, as you can imagine. So we should be extremely careful. Again, we should be sure that these sections here are randomized, which is really difficult to achieve. But even if the sections are randomized, what I see here can be just the tip of the iceberg. So what is the exact size of this particle? It can be as big as this. 
The same for the small ones. But the, same, the small ones can also be very tiny particles. So difficult, very difficult to estimate. This is a so-called second principle of stereology, where there are equations to try to invert the two-dimensional distribution into a three-dimensional one. I don't want to bring you in this direction. I think at some point we also need to be very practical. So we need to move away from looking at products where we have a huge range of different particle sizes. And if we have loose particles, we can typically see the particles make sure that we prepare fractions and sections on sized materials. So here, usually the good practice, if you receive a concentrate or a product, you will see it into, for example, four or five different fractions. We will take the 75, 150, 150 micron, the 150, 350 micron size, etc., cetera, and you will prepare sections of those different uh, size fractions. You prepare a section, a random section, etc. And there again, of course, you have smaller sections and larger sections. But you know at least that the largest ones, they are probably close to cutting the equator, the median particle. So this is rather interesting. And if you also use a measure, which is the inscribed disk, you come closer to the result you would have obtained by seeing. Just consider a pebble or any particle cut it and place a, an inscribed disk into it, you will see that you will be very close to what seeding would have given to you. So this is best practice, then what people usually do, which is to work on unsized fraction and to use the number of pixels as an estimate of the size. If you use the number of pixels, you can be far away from the real size. I take the example here where two grains are connected, because they might be interconnected, you can interpret a, a grain which is twice as big as it really is. Whereas when you use the inscribed disk, you have a much better estimate of the real size. So there are plenty of things to be said about how to properly measure size and shape. Uh, I just want to warn you again against the fact that it's important to work on size fraction instead of relying on sophisticated mathematics to try to invert the 2D distribution into, into, into a 3D one. By the way, the good thing also with this inscribed disk is that it correlates very well with something that we often need, which has to do with the dissolution time. If I need to dissolve this particle, uh, I remind you this is a random section, so there is no risk that this is a, or there is limited risk that this is a very flaky particle. So, because it's a random section, I can say that this disk is proportional to the time needed to melt this particle or suddenly to dissolve it, considering a, an isotropic dissolution front, of course. Now, I come to another point which has to do with liberation. So many particles, if we look back at uh, this kind of section, we see that we have uh, particles which are not always monomineralic, so many of them are made of two, eventually three different minerals. The question is how we can quantify this. Well, for every particle, we can, of course, compute the modern mineralogy. You can say for every particle, it is made out of 50% blue, 50% orange. It's made out of 10% yellow, 30% brown, and the rest 70% orange, etc. That's very easy. Of course, it gives you a huge amount of data, big data, and you need to find your way through all these data. Again, it's a three-dimensional problem. And it's a really tricky one. So there's plenty of literature in trying to estimate the three-dimensional liberation from the two-dimensional sections. Again, I would not recommend doing that. I would prefer to draw your attention to the fact that, again, you should move away from the very small sections, the ones that are just the tip of the iceberg, and look at the largest ones. So if you have a fraction which has been sized before, you know you are working here with 150, 350 microns particles, you will typically look at the largest section, so you'll throw away the very small sections and you will focus on the largest ones. The largest ones are probably closer to the median section as I said, so if you have a particle which is like binary, like this one, with blue and orange, if you have a large section, such as this one, you see that you almost always have blue and orange. So it's closer statistically 
to what's inside the particle. Whereas the small sections, they can be 100% blue, 100% orange, and these are the ones that are tricky to deal with. So my recommendation, which is very empirical, which drops all the stereological corrections, is to look at larger sections and to draw conclusions about liberations from the larger sections. Sometimes they will appear 100% liberated even when the particle is 50-50, obviously, but statistically, it should be closer to uh, what you're looking for. Now, liberation is just, as, as often understood, liberation is just the proportion by volume, by surface, or so by volume, of the two minerals in a particle. Uh, we'll come back to that, but you might think that it would be better to have eventually a proportion by mass. If this is, let's say, wolframite and this is quartz, it makes quite a big difference. Uh, but you could also consider that liberation could be interesting in terms of perimeter, to say that the external pyramid of your particle is made out maybe of 40% orange and 60% blue, and not just 50-50. So all these things are possible if you use, let's say, a bit more sophisticated image analysis techniques. So here, without introducing the details, I just would like to draw your attention to some work we did in PhD studies, looking at texture indices. So if I take typically this particle, you see that it's a mix. Uh, this is typically coming from a copper mineralization where we have both primary copper and secondary copper sulfides. So we often have like calcopyrite, which could be yellow, and we have green, which is typically charcoalite. So we need to be able to put numbers on this kind of particle. This can be done by, for example, computing what are called intercepts. So you throw a line, a random line, and you look at the number of intersections, which are yellow, green, or green, yellow. You can also count the length, the average run length within the yellow phase or the average run length within the green phase. All these things are computable and can serve the needs of computing indices. So in this case, we developed typical indices based on these statistics because we wanted to make the difference between, for example, particles of this kind, which we called corona type, where you have calcopyrite totally embedded in a rim of charcoal So the property of this particle, in terms of flotation in particular, is the property of charcoal and not at all the one of calcopyrite. This one is a bit more complex. You see this, this veined stockwork, as we call it, kind of texture. It is interesting because eventually by regrinding, then we will be able to break it apart into uh, different pieces, we will be able to liberate it eventually a bit more. And the same here, it's a simple texture where a simple breakage could eventually separate calcopyrite from chalcosite. So in this study in particular, which has been published, to see, for example, that instead of giving the amount of calcopyrite or chalcosite in a concentrate, or instead of even speaking about liberation, we go a bit more into the details, speaking about the liberated calcopyrite for the yellow, fraction, 66%, and speaking about simple integrals, or speaking about rim or semi-rim, or stockwork kind of textures. This, of course, is meaningless to you and me, but it was meaningful to the guy who is running the concentrator, who understands to which extent these kind of textures is impacting his recoveries. Uh, the same mathematics here can lead to some interesting indices. I just want to, without giving you the details of how we compute these parameters, but you can easily imagine that we can, for example, give an idea about the length of this interfacial boundary between green and yellow. So what is in red here is, for example, uh, measured and normalized with respect to the surface of the particle. And this could be linked, for example, to an index which we suggest to call breakability because it has to do with the amount of interface between two different phases. In this case, we are looking at the outer surface, as I said, and for example, the amount of yellow, which is connected to the outer surface. We could also give an idea of the average length, and this could be linked to floatability. Don't think this is science fiction. Several works have shown that this really impacts floatability. You have to imagine that bubbles will have to attach here, and where you have a long surface, or when you have a lot of very small broken surfaces, of course, will make a difference. So we now have tools, we have mathematical tools to feed our models. 
Again, to be realistic, and I said it in the beginning, we still need hours and hours to collect images. We have still challenges in properly computing the size, shape, texture indices. But as soon as we have that information, we can move into something which is a bit more advanced. If now we start adding a bit more physical properties, because it's not about geometry. So what I mean is that if you have a map of minerals, this is a piece of ore where we have, uh, again, copper sulfide, we have tin copper sulfide, which is stenite in red, we have zinc sulfide in yellow, iron sulfide in green, etc. A bit of quartz somewhere in black. Okay, this is a typical section. Of course, we can describe it in terms of proportion of calcopyrite, stenite, phalerite. We can convert it back into chemistry. But what is important for us is to be able to move from this geometrical distribution of pixels into indices which will say something about the breakability, about eventually magnetic susceptibility, about floatability, as I just mentioned, in other cases, leachability, etc. But this requires not just the exact geometrical measurement, but also requires to add information about physical properties of minerals. So we need also, and this is not only that has to be developed, we need mineral intelligence. We need to develop databases which contain as much information as possible about individual minerals. And surprisingly, this is not that well known. Okay, most minerals are well described by their chemistry, that's for sure. So we often know their density. For some of them, not all, we know the hardness, which is an important parameter. For some of them, we know magnetic susceptibility, resistivity, the electric constant, which are very important for, again, magnetic and electromagnetic separation. Hydrophobicity, which is key in flotation, is usually not known at all. So we have, of course, a lot of experience, empirical experience, but we don't have specific measures. And the same for many other properties. So there's still a big lack in terms of what I would call here mineral intelligence, in terms of having databases of all physical properties of minerals that could be linked to our image analysis results to provide us with physical properties of minerals. What we would like to have is a parameter which is uh, precise enough to eventually help us in developing simulation. So here you see a representation of what is called particle tracking in process simulation. So mineral processing engineers today, they can represent their plant, like uh, in a simulation software. So this is coming from HSC, developed by Otto Kumpo. You can typically draw your uh, flow sheet, you have your crusher, you have your sag mill, you have a ball mill, you have hydrocyclone, you eventually have flotation cells, etc. afterwards. These uh, different unit processes are well known. Usually they would work with simulation models that are based on the fact that if you feed them with a certain particle size distribution, you get another kind of particle size distribution as an output. If I take the example of hydrocyclone, you can imagine that the properties of this hydrocyclone in a given regime are well known and that you will cut the distribution at the given size. But here we would like to go one step further. We would like to feed this virtual plant with real particles, the real particles that we collected from our automated mineralogy system. We would like to feed our simulation software with real particles. You see the different fractions, like 38, 38, 75, 75, 106 microns, etc. So these different size fractions I mentioned. And based on the images, so essentially based on physical properties derived from the image analysis based on the individual properties of, of uh, particles, sorry, we should be able, and this is the idea of particle tracking, to say, well, this particle will go all over the process and end up in the concentrate. This other particle will end up in the tailings. Of course, here it's schematic. In the general case, you have a lot of concentrates rougher flotation concentrates and scavenger flotation concentrates, you have rougher tailings, you have middlings, okay, the whole process could be simulated. And our final dream, of course, would be from the digital twin of the old body, 
without even mining it, just virtually mining it, be able to optimize the process and be able to design the best possible process for different kind of textures that we found originally in the deposit. If this becomes possible, then of course it does mean that we will have also good guidelines for optimum mining. The mine planning should be done in terms of trying to feed the plant with a stable feed. This is often challenging, but of course maybe the future will also be uh, the other way around. Maybe we'll ask more and more the mineral processing engineer to have to introduce flexibility in the plant. In other words, we will mine the deposit as it is. We will mine different parts of the deposit, having different textures, different properties, and the plant will have to adapt to the variability of the feed. But this all will be possible only with simulation. So as a conclusion, I would like to say that there's still a long way to go. What I've presented here is typically what is linking geology to mineral processing. So I did not really discuss the place of mining, which is in between. But please keep in mind, if you are mining engineers, you're essentially serving the people who are downstream and you're serving those guys by mining a deposit which has been described by geologists. So geometallurgy is typically, from mine to mill, is typically uh, a science which requires dialogue and understanding and which requires to develop a common language. So with this, I'm happy to answer your questions. It's a pity I can't be with you, but I hope you will have some questions and of course you're welcome to look a bit further into the research that we're doing here. Thank you very much.